Um, excited to have you all here with us. Uh, I'm Julie Lammer, Senior Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy for American Student Assistance. Um, we are a national nonprofit that's focused on college and career readiness issues, specifically working to help kids as young as middle school um, understand their own personal interests and aptitudes uh, that can help them inform, test and try, and uh, build the path towards post-secondary education success. So we are um, here today with some experts in, in the field of, of skill building and entrepreneurship. Um, this is gonna be an exciting conversation. We've had some changes to the program, so if you were looking for others on the stage, um, we appreciate Stephanie's willingness to, to pinch hit um, <laughs> for um, America Succeeds, um, and we did lose a panelist, unfortunately, who had some travel issues, um, but we will uh, try to fill in their parts of the conversation as best we can. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, with some brief introductions, and then we'll jump into the conversation. So. Stephanie Short is the Vice President of Partnerships for America Succeeds. Um, America Succeeds is an education nonprofit that brings together business and education to improve education opportunities, outcomes, and equity. Um, Edson Barton is CEO and founder of U-Science, a student engagement platform that starts uh, by helping students uh, discover their aptitudes and career um, I interests. Uh, they serve more than 5.5 million students since their creation. Is that accurate? <laughs> um, and then Naomi Thomas is CEO of Infinity EDU, a platform leveraging gamification, mentorship, and incentives um, for diverse learners to gain uh, tech skills. So with that high level, I'm going to ask all of you to sort of give your elevator pitch of, of your organizations, what you do. Maybe, Naomi, I'll start with you on, on the end and um, tell us a little bit about what you do at Infinity EDU. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Naomi. I am the CEO of Infinity EDU, where we are building the future of tech education in Web3. We take a passion-first approach to tech career exploration, and we turn brands into universities so, well, so that students learn through the roles that they're interested in pursuing. Um, really excited about this conversation to dive a little deeper into how students are leveraging technology to explore entrepreneurship. Um, kids aren't you know, starting lemonade stands anymore. They're turning their hobbies into million-dollar companies and making hundreds of thousand dollars off of NFTs and really just taking advantage of the digital world. Um, so really excited to talk more about how technology is enhancing the entrepreneurial experience, whether students become entrepreneurs themselves or have an entrepreneurial type of spirit with as an employee at their company. Um, and yeah, super excited to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Edson? Uh, Edson Barton again, uh, CEO of U-Science. Uh, U-Science is a AI-based um, application that works all the way from middle school all the way through connecting individuals with uh, their career. And the way that we do that is we help an individual discover their true aptitudes and what they're inherently talented in. That opens up the aperture of what they are capable of. And that's really critical in today's society where too many of us are limited by our own personal self-biases and stereotypes and those of the environment around us. Based on that, we then help individuals uh, transition from phase to phase, from middle school into high school, properly through the high school programs into the proper uh, programs, really strengthening the equity and diversity of the pathway programs that we offer, and then helping to transition those individuals into their very best fit post-secondary education programs, not necessarily the school, but into the right programs, and then also connecting those with employers where they have the best fit as well. So completing the whole, the whole journey, if you will, from end to end, from middle school to career, and helping do that in a much more efficient and direct way for both the individuals and for all the organizations that are supporting them. Great, Stephanie. Great. My name is Stephanie Short. I'm Vice President of Partnerships at America Succeeds. And we're a nonprofit that engages business leaders in improving equity outcomes and opportunity in education. Uh, the majority of that work happens through policy and advocacy, but at the national level, we also work on projects like our Durable Skills Initiative. And durable skills are a combination of how you use what you know, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and character skills like leadership and resilience. And these are foundational for any career pathway. We have the data to prove it. We have the anecdotal evidence to prove it. But frankly, they, they play a really critical role in also setting 
students up for success as entrepreneurs, right? Like the, the tech skills um, can help you build NFTs or really cool companies, but the reality of uh, continually facing challenges, of innovating, of building client and customer relationships come down to these durable skills. And we think they're uh, an important part of supporting those pathways. That's great. Um, so, so Edson, in addition to those durable skills, you, at U-Science, you also sort of take a passion-first approach to helping kids understand their, their passions. And then how do you link that to building the skills necessary to achieve that goal? So can you just tell us a little bit about that work um, and, and that sort of uh, interest identity? Um, yeah, I think the, the basis of that really is how do you identify what you're naturally inherently good at? And if you look at entrepreneurs across history, they had kind of a combination of things. Ones they, they had a desire, a true passion in, in an area, but probably more importantly is they had this inherent capability to think outside the box for what they were trying to achieve, mm -hmm. whatever area that was. And so you, the, the real goal that we're working on is trying to help an individual identify the deep talents that they have as an individual. And that's very different than the interests that they have, and in particular for young people. So young people just don't understand uh, the world around them quite as well as we do as adults, and we even struggle quite a bit, right? Um, but when you're young, your, your vision of who you are and what you can become is incredibly limited. And that's limited by your environment and, uh, and what's happened to you throughout your life. So as an example, interests uh, that students have, and, and most, of, most of the school systems today are using interest-based surveys or personality surveys to guide students towards careers. The problem is if you don't, if you've never experienced something, you can't have an interest mm -hmm. in it. Uh, a simple example of that is a lot of the interest-based surveys will ask something like, do you like woodworking or do you like mountain climbing, right? <laughs> well, if you've never experienced either of those, then how, how are sounds you going to answer that? That's right. It sounds, sounds good. good. Check sure. and you move sure. on. <laughs> and the results then become very dysfunctional for mm -hmm. an individual. Uh, whereas with the aptitude, when you look at those inherently, you're looking at an individual and saying, who are you? And we use a, a bunch of brain games to tease that out of an individual so it's not self-reported at that yeah. point. And then we're able to guide the student to this larger field of opportunities that they may never even have, have thought of before. Mm -hmm. So uh, as an example, an aptitude is numerical reasoning. A skill would be uh, information systems or building you know, accountancy or something like that. So by understanding the aptitude underneath a person, then we can guide them towards these different fields that they haven't thought of. The reason why that's important with entrepreneurship is if you can help an individual find that thing that they do incredibly well, then they are more suited to be successful in that. Right. Just a really simple example is writing, it's doing something with your dominant hand versus your non-dominant hand. Um, I can write with my non-dominant hand, but it's painful for me to do that. It's hard. I, it's, it's, I can't make the characters flow like I can. But when I use my dominant hand, everything seems more natural. It seems easier to do. So if we can help an individual student find those careers where they have those natural aptitudes, then all of a sudden they explode. Uh, with success, and they enjoy it, and, and they like it, that then leads to the ability to look at the world differently, mm -hmm. and how can we then change the world, which is entrepreneurship, yep. right? So it really leads to that. that that's great. So, uh, Naomi, um, let me turn to you. So, so you're an entrepreneur yourself. You know, you saw a problem that you um, had a passion about and really wanted to solve. So talk a little bit about um, sort of how your company operates and, and the specific skills and problems here that you're trying to solve through it. Yeah, so the biggest issue that, um, you know, I set forth to solve within the company um, it came from my lived experiences. Um, I've been in the tech industry for a while. I was six years old when I built my first computer. I went through a lot of different STEM programs through middle and high school. Um, one was a computer science institute at UC Berkeley as well as UVA, but I was having the opportunity to tour several tech companies in the area while I was um, attending those programs, um, mesmerized by just the tech company employee experience with 
the free food and the lax dress code <laughs> and, you know, just the way they design their offices and just really focused on that employee experience. But at the same time, I was simultaneously just disappointed in the overwhelming lack of representation amongst, you know, diverse talent. And I became very mission driven and really leverage that um, passion to want to get my peers interested in tech. Um, it was difficult for me to like explain how incredible this world of technology was. It's a, it's a place where students can, you know, you can create anything out of anything and it's not something where you have to be a certain type of um, stereotype of a programmer or a developer that's like coding in a dark room and no, like it's just a lot of stereotypes within a lot of my friends that they had against people that were in tech. Um, and I wanted to explain that there's so many different opportunities in the tech industry that are non-technical as well. You could work for Sephora um, as an AI engineer or Google as a marketer or you know work in HR and sales. Um, and so thinking about this approach and how many tech many companies are becoming more you know, tech enabled and innovating within the tech space, it's important to understand that you can still have a role in tech um, in an industry that you're passionate about. So taking that passion first approach is through industries that students learn um, or love or are interested in. So if they you know, like basketball, they're interested in the sports industry, but they don't make it to the league, they could still work for their favorite NBA team, but as a data analyst or work for Nike as a software engineer. So with in Infinity EDU, we are highlighting all of the, the different roles within various industries um, that students are familiar with but may not recognize or have that exposure to um, just tech career opportunities within them. And we also do that through, um, you know, that passion first approach. And then we're incentivizing the learning process, getting into Web3 with crypto. We minted um, an infinity token recently. It's a utility token that helps students learn tech skills, earn tokens and redeem prizes from their favorite brands. And by taking this approach and bridging the gap between education and the tech workforce, um, we are helping students learn through the roles that they're interested in pursuing. Taking this intentional approach instead of navigating the industry blindly, a lot of students, um, when, when I speak to different students, they ask me, you know, I'm interested in tech, where do I start? And that's like the biggest question. It's like, okay, you could go on YouTube, you could go take a coding boot camp, you could take you know, learn several different languages and students are really like navigating the tech industry blindly right now um, where they're taking skills here and there and they end up in a role that they may not eventually even like. Um, so by turning a brand into university and turning their roles and dissecting all the skills that are needed for those roles into curriculum and turning their tech stack into curriculum, we find that is a more intentional and more, um, you know, just viable approach to help students not waste as much time, but also just be more direct and see what is ahead of them and experience it before they actually take on that role. So we're excited to help, you know, improve um, just retention levels at companies and just interest in the tech industry and reaching you know diverse and underserved communities in this way where you could not you don't have to just be a consumer of a product you can also be a creator and your perspective is important to be in those rooms um, anybody that is being impacted by a product should have their perspective in their you know reflected within those rooms that are building those products so we're excited to to continue spreading that message and and helping equip the next generation of technologists so in addition to um, ensuring that they uh, that students understand available opportunities in existing companies you talked a little bit about how they are using entrepreneurship skills to really um, uh, delve deeper into some of their hobbies and turn their hobbies into business. So can you just talk a little bit about how some of your students are doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's always important um, when starting, if you're thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, definitely see if you can like monetize your hobby um, and start you know, a little bit smaller um, and definitely 
if it's something that you love and you want to continue doing, you should um, definitely pursue that. Um, and with the students that we serve right now, you know, a lot of them are interested in um, exploring different types of ways to meet their communities online and leveraging social media to do that. So with the power of like all the different tools um, that students are leveraging via TikTok and Instagram and really monetizing their own personal brands, they're becoming entrepreneurs within their own, you know, their own community within their own brand and, and making themselves a brand and monetizing themselves with influencing and things of that nature. My experience as an influencer, I was able to monetize and that turned into a digital marketing agency that I've been running for the past four years. Um, and so that's an example just personally, but we've also provided that, you know, type of um, you know, logic and recommendations to the students that we serve to take their hobbies and turn them into, you know, actual businesses. But at the same time, entrepreneurship doesn't, ha you don't have to run your own company to be an entrepreneur. Um, I feel like if everybody is an entrepreneur and everybody has their own company and nobody's working for anybody's companies, I mean, what are we going to do? Like, um, so you can, it's important for students or learners or employees to have ownership within the companies and be, have that entrepreneurial spirit and for the workforce to be able to um, provide those type of opportunities for um, employees to feel like they are owning something and actually running their own business within um, the company or being a puzzle piece, you know, part of an entire bigger, you know, operation. Um, so those entrepreneurial skills can be transferable within the workforce. So it's important that anybody that's working, whether they have their own company or they're part of another, to have those types of skills. Yeah, um, that's great. So um, if our friends from Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship were here, they would say, you know, the things that they look at identifying um, are opportunities for students to understand what the opportunity is that exists, right? To have uh, understand future orientation to those opportunities and be comfortable with risk. And those are the things that they really key in on as those key entrepreneurship skills that will transfer anywhere. So from an employer perspective, what are you hearing um, you know, over and over again about, you know, we talk about skills, um, some say soft skills, some say essential skills, America Succeeds calls them durable skills, and this is really driven by employer desire to, to understand what the, um, what the essential characteristics of a future employee might need to be. Um, talk a little bit about that work and, and how that came about. Of course. Um, the reality is we live in a world that the only thing you can count on is change, right? So uh, this work with durable skills really launched out of a different project uh, that we were leading called Age of Agility, where uh, now five, six years ago, all of our business leaders were coming to us saying, the future of work is changing and it's changing really rapidly. And we have to start thinking differently about how we prepare students for future success. And we talked all the time uh, during that project about the students that are in schools today are going to need skills that we haven't yet identified. They're going to use technologies that haven't been invented yet. And they are going to be tasked with solving problems that we don't even know are problems. And so when you're looking ahead to that kind of world, trying to carve out entrepreneurship, trying to carve out a career pathway that's meaningful to you, what is the one thing that lasts? And those are these durable skills. Communication, your aptitude for taking risk, your ability to put together complex problems, and, and your ability to understand yourself, those inherent characteristics that give you agency to solve the problems you want to solve, to impact your community, to contribute to an employer. And it's not just a, a business imperative, right? Companies need talent that can do these things, but they also live and work in communities. They have employees, they have customers. So durable skills become this kind of foundational piece mm -hmm. of how they impact the world, whether it's to make a profit, whether it's to make an impact, and uh, whether it's setting up their, you know, kind of future talent pathways for success. 
How do you at America's Seeds Seeds try to sort of break through the noise that is out there of either you, you just need to like really specific technical training to be successful, or you just need a set of um, basic skills uh, for every student. Well, how do you talk about the needs for durable skills in this way? And, and the fact that you need both, right? You need some, some version of both. Yeah, uh, well, you're right that it's noisy. <laughs> um, but frankly, we joke all the time, right? Uh, I actually started in tech and had my own company. At some point, those skills were valuable, but they quickly perish. And at this point, the only skills I have are durable skills. And so for any business leader that we're talking to, or if you're just simply looking in the mirror, you can understand the importance of these skills, how they made such a difference in, in where you are today, the companies that you've founded, the technologies that you've created. Mm -hmm. And frankly, people want to work with other people who communicate well, collaborate well, you know, are nice on a team. Yeah. And so it's not as hard of a sell as, as one would think. We inherently understand how all of these pieces come together, whether it's for future entrepreneurs or just future teammates. And so that has helped us kind of break through with the idea of durable skills. Where at Science, how do you help build that? that um, it, you know, Stephanie talks very eloquently about it. How do you then go out and make sure that students are, are getting these skills and can, and can also identify them in themselves so they can communicate to others that they exist and this is how I will act in a workplace? Um, do, do you do much of that at Science? Well, the way that we do that, and, and if, you, if you peel that back just one layer, one of the issues that every student has is, do I feel comfortable doing some of those durable skills? So communication skills don't come naturally to mm -hmm. a lot of people, right. right? Or critical thinking is a different type of skill. But when you, if you think about that in terms of, if I am in an area that I am naturally and talented in, and I start to love that area, I actually start to gain a lot of confidence in myself and my abilities to then communicate those things. So as an example, I have a brother-in-law who is an environmental toxicologist. He found out that he loved birds. He's an avian toxicologist within that. Um, he loved birds. And, you know, when you sit down and talk with him, he's a very pleasant fellow all of the time. <laughs> but when you get him on the subject that he loves... All of a sudden, you can't shut him up, right? But it's in a powerful, engaging way that he loves. And if you can get a kid who's interested in welding, and all of a sudden they can communicate everything about that world to you, and they can start explaining things differently and in, in, in new ways. So, And that's true of computer science. It's can, true of manufacturing, whatever it, it may be. So if we can help an individual find that that passion for a career and guiding them towards that and really helping them flourish in that, then coupling that with these other skill sets that they need, that's where you start to see real growth happen. Yeah. Now, some of us are, are more naturally talented towards what you'd call academic skills, and a lot of the durable skills are part of those academic skills. And so the challenge that we have as a, as a society and education community is how do we help the larger portion of those students because it is the larger portion mm -hmm. that need that because there's it's it's a subset of the population that have those skills naturally yeah. so really as you start to help an individual build on their successes they gain that confidence and now they're willing to talk to you about things and they're willing to engage and those types of things take practice. So as an example, if you're in a class with, a, with an educator and you don't quite connect with that educator because it's in a subject that you don't, doesn't speak to you, your relationship with the teacher becomes, uh, it becomes harder. You don't feel like you can communicate with the teacher. And that's your mentor in that class. Whereas if you're in a class where you naturally connect with the, with the educator, now you're talking with an adult, if you're a young person, you're talking with an adult on a different level, and all of a sudden the communication starts to come much more naturally. And you build that skill set up, and now you're talking with your peers in a more natural way. And you're developing these, these durable skills, which are critical 
but you're developing them in a very natural way mm -hmm. at this point rather than a forced way. Yeah. So that's the way I would look at it. Um, so you touched on a point there that I think is really, really important. Um, you know, uh, the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship talks a lot about the necessity in entrepreneurship to um, ensure that there are high quality and repeat mentoring programs. Um, Naomi, I'm going to start with you. Just interesting, interested how you bring mentors into the work that you're doing uh, with your students. Yeah, so um, it's it's really important to have that mentorship component. Um, and, you know, especially navigating the tech industry, um, and, it's, and specifically with the demographic that we are serving, um, especially underserved communities that may not see themselves in, in the leaders that are within the tech industry or amongst their um, peers as they are navigating. It may seem a little isolating and lonely if they're entering rooms um, that you know, people may not look like them or, you know, things of that nature and, and dealing with different biases. Um, my experience within that, I, mentorship has been extremely vital to my career journey. Um, I studied computer science for three years and ended up dropping the major because I was experiencing a lot of what my peers were um, in different schools and I was one of the only black women in my classes and a lot of people wouldn't, you know, pair with me for class projects and all these different things. But um, having that mentorship component and joining other like networks um, that provided a mentor to help say like, you know, you are not alone and this is something that is unfortunately a reality in today's day. But um, if you are, stay, stay with it and you are being one of the only to like go through this, then, you know, you're paving a way for so many others that may be feeling this type of way. Um, and so joining those communities and having mentors is so important. So with mentorship, we are preparing to, you know, couple our students with um, that type of support and guidance from um, the different ERG groups at um, brands that have, you know, that passion to reach the demographic that we are serving um, and help, you know, say, you know, like, we, we need you in these rooms. We need your perspective. It's very important to have you building these products that are reaching consumers that it's, we're not just building for one type of person, but for all. Um, and so, yeah, we're excited to, to continue doing that and leveraging, like, taking an innovative approach to this. So we're building out our Discord channel, um, something that a lot of Gen Z um, students are using. Um, and and in, we're preparing to invite, you know, a lot of different brands to speak to students and have speaker series within the channels um, so that they can have a little bit more insight into working um, for those companies and making them feel like, you know, welcome and inclusive. Um, so, yeah, we're really excited to, to leverage the power of mentorship to, to impact the future of the tech workforce. Do you have anything to add, add either of you? No? No. Okay. Um. From, from a mentorship perspective, that, that's critical. I think one of the challenges that we face as educators is how do we develop those mentorship relationships in a sustainable way. Yeah. Um, leveraging inside the school systems, you already have a network there uh, in the fact of you have teachers, you have your, your peer groups. And I think one of the things that's really critical is if we can get students into the correct classes where they can really come alive, then those are more naturally formed. They're mm -hmm. not always easy to form, right? Well, there's always some different challenges, but they're easier to form in those areas. And the ability for that network to then reach outside of the school systems and, and communicate with businesses uh, becomes more natural and easy as well. Yeah. So it supports the whole system by doing that career type education that's focused on the individual's needs. Yeah. I would I would just say also right like that the social capital component of this we cannot overlook we have talked a lot Clayton Christensen Institute has talked a lot about durable skills and durable networks together really needing to kind of be in coordination if we're going to shift a larger narrative around equity, diversity, and inclusion in the workforce. And we're seeing employers be really mindful of that, whether it's mentoring within their own company, around durable skills, around promotion, or mentoring with students. They understand that representation matters, that connecting into communities they haven't been in before matters, and the workforce of tomorrow needs that mentorship just as much as the companies need that workforce. 
it, are there things that uh, we as a community can be doing to encourage more of that from employers? I, I think often it is sort of left to educators to sort of figure out how to navigate this problem. Um, do you hear, are there exemplars of good organizations doing this really, really well um, that you know of? <laughs> I'm not pausing because they don't exist. I promise they really do exist in so many great places. I know CAPS Network is up front here. They work so closely with the business community. Anyone that hasn't met Corey should talk to him about the role of mentorship in that work. It's Yeah, it's very quality. But... Um, I think we're having it more, frankly, from like a personal conversation perspective with other business leaders is what does mentorship look like on your team? What mm -hmm. does mentorship look like within your company? And uh, it is more powerful for us to activate individual champions to change culture and get to the scale that we'd like to see. I was going to add, like, well, as it relates to even online learning, right, um, this world is becoming just more remote and self-paced self learning opportunities. But, you know, as we've seen, um, you know, a cohort-based learning is such an incredible um, opportunity to embed that mentorship within the learning experience. Um, and we see a lot more of a successful completion rates. I think it's 75% for cohort-based learning versus, I think, 5 to 7% for self-paced courses. So it's important, you know, that just goes to show how important mentorship through that cohort um, and, and having peers and, and having the opportunity to develop durable skills and having a guide through the learning experience, um, that's just so important. I just wanted to add that. Um, one other thing I would add there is um, the businesses that uh, almost every business that I talk to says they want to do something, mm -hmm. right? It's very rare that somebody doesn't want to help. <laughs> but how so, is the yeah, question. but how, how? is yeah. the question? And, and so often the businesses come to this point where they're, they're receiving students for a mentorship, a mentorship kind of relationship or an internship or apprenticeship, and the students don't fit the business's needs mm -hmm. either. And so there's a mismatch there. And whenever there's a mismatch, you have to make a choice. Am I doing this as a business? Am I doing this to just help and be altruistic? Or does it really help my business? And of course, if come push come to shove, it's going to be if it helps my business. Um, not because they don't want to, but because just the necessity of business. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we can do better to help scale the, the mentor relationships is to identify how do we connect an individual student to the business for the needs of the business and the needs of the student. Mm -hmm. And when you can do that both at the same time, which is very possible to do, then that relationship can flourish. And it's scalable at that point because now we can look at businesses across the board and say, how do we connect this student to you and this student to you rather than just pick and choose the few businesses that raise their hands and just throw all the students that way. And, and, that, and really well aligned with the students' interests that they have hopefully already uncovered. That's and it's right. not, they're not waiting until the opportunity of entering a business to sort of test and try what they might like. That's right. They've already had some, some experience there. Yes. Well, I was going to add to, there's a lot of educating that needs to happen to businesses. They are often surprised. They think about students in a really specific way. They're thinking about Gen Z in a really specific way. And it's when these students show up in their businesses and they see truly when they're matched with a passion and some of their inherent skills, what value that they bring. Mm -hmm. And so we've also not only ed educated individual business leaders, but kind of leveraged the power of that storytelling for business leaders to talk amongst themselves so they can think differently about these opportunities. Yeah. So one thing that um, we sort of always fall back on um, in, in education space is how do you measure this? So a question about how... Um, you measure progress towards obtaining durable skills. These are things that, by nature, right, are hard to, to test <laughs> um, and prove that you have. So how do we talk to employers that, about the fact that these, we have gained these skills, and what more do we need to do in that space to ensure that we can properly articulate that? Great question. Um, so I will say, right, the, one of the things we're talking about at this conference is that America Succeeds is partnering with CompTIA 
to work towards solving exactly that problem. Um, these skills are inherently difficult to measure. And in a case where it, it feels kind of subjective, if someone is evaluating your communication, your critical thinking, we're trying to find an objective way to verify and credential those skills. So more coming, hopefully, by the end of this year. Um, but the measurement piece, I would kind of bore out in the origins of this work, right? We have talked about these durable skills, these inherent skills for a really long time. We have, I have a library full of anecdotes about how important they are in the workforce. But we decided to build a framework with the help of MZ Burning Glass. It's 10 skills with 10 keyword terms each that are represented in job postings. And we ran that through more than 80 million jobs. And 77% of all jobs require these durable skills. And that data, that story, and, and kind of measurement, if you will, elevated the conversation in a way that it, it hadn't been elevated previously. We can also now leverage that data to move towards measurement, to move towards kind of agreement in this space to verify and credential. And I think over time, that really has the impact to change how we're thinking about this work. That's great. That's exciting to hear. Um, more to come at the, by the end of the year. We'll check back in. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, let me turn to you at you, science. Like, well, how do you measure your success um, beyond, uh, you, you know, the the metrics of sort of engagement and participation, and and what are the long term outcomes you're looking to achieve? Yeah, for for us, when we look at uh, the the complete metrics that we're measuring or looking at. Um, it really comes down to are we getting more diverse populations into pathways that they haven't been in before? So that's a critical component for us. Uh, are we in, in, impacting graduation rates positively both on the secondary side but just as important on the post-secondary side? Mm -hmm. Uh, we tend to forget that there's a 42% dropout rate in post-secondary education. That's abysmal. Um, but it comes from the same issues, right? right? Um, and post-secondary enrollment rates. And that post-secondary doesn't mean four-year colleges specifically, but it means everything from a technical school to, you know, even a boot camp of some kind. And really, it should be transformed into lifelong learning over right. time. And then ultimately, are we helping individuals obtain jobs that were meaningful to them and the employers coming back in the same direction? So we look at it in all of those different types of metrics and ongoing basis. Right. And Naomi, how about yeah, you? Yeah, so um, with learning tech skills, um, we definitely want to create an environment that students are not only um, finding their dream jobs or exploring what their future could look like just through their passions, but also, you know, becoming a voice for others and um, measuring that through like social capital and leveraging the power of social media and seeing how far, you know, they're able, they're willing to talk about it and tell their friends to, um, to participate. Um, how we're doing the platform that we are evolving into with the incentive based learning, um, leveraging incentives for retention on the platform and creating an environment that um, is you know, wrapped around the cohort-based learning um, so that students feel like they have the necessary support to be able to go from point A to point B, um, whether or not they make different career changes throughout their journey. Um, we definitely want to make sure that they are provided the necessary support to do so. Um, and how we are measuring that is, is just through, you know, the feedback that we're getting through our platform so far with um, almost 3,000 users that have gone through our platform. Um, over 1,700 have provided like paragraph worthy like pieces of feedback that have been 98% positive um, in a way that we're providing more support on what more industries that they can um, explore and what different um, you know types of roles that they're interested in being part of or even creating for themselves. Um, and students are very smart and brilliant. Like they will create their own role at a company or be able to pitch that. And we want them to be able to leverage their own um, creativity to um, to really, you know, define what their future will look like. So we're excited to to see more of that and um, you know encourage that innovation. 
That's wonderful. Well, we are at time. Um, this goes by so quickly. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, really appreciate this conversation. I'm sure um, our, our panelists will be available. If you have uh, follow-up questions, um, please reach out. We appreciate you joining us today, and everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>